Houston, we have a problem. I created a bit of a problem last week by offering to mail a sticker to anybody who submitted a pull request to this repo, and now I'm stuck with over 600 code changes to review and merge. I could sit at my computer for a few days and manually merge each one by clicking a button, but luckily we have this awesome thing called code that lets us do this thing called programming to solve problems like this. In today's video, we'll look at the steps involved in what many consider to be the most important skill of a software developer, problem solving. We'll look at seven different concepts that can help you solve coding problems quickly and reliably. When you become comfortable with these concepts, you'll be able to ship code faster and be more comfortable in technical interviews. We can use my real-world problem with pull requests as an example. What we have here is a very specialized use case, but it represents one of the most fundamental problems that software solves. The elimination of manual, repetitive work. Many new developers start their programming journey focused on learning a language. And that's perfectly fine, because obviously you need to know a language to solve problems with code. But when you get to know highly experienced developers, you'll realize that their skill set is more about problem solving than it is about knowing every single feature of the language they use. That's why most of the top companies have you do whiteboarding problems in interviews. They want insight into your thought process when you approach a software development problem. Because that skill is much more difficult to learn than memorizing the syntax of a programming language. It takes years of experience and practice to get good at. But once you have it down, you'll be able to confidently turn your ideas into reality through the magic of code. And you won't even need YouTube channels like this for tutorials. But in the meantime, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss the next sticker giveaway. Now I want to start things off by saying that everybody's brain is different and there's no one universal right way to solve a problem. I'm going to show you techniques that work well for me, but follow your instincts and do what works best for you. The first step is to identify and understand the nature of the problem. If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. In our case, we have 600 pull requests on GitHub, and we don't want to have to click this stupid button 600 times. So what we have here is an internal optimization that will hopefully save us time and money. But there are many different types of software problems out there. You might have a bug in existing software where you have to look through the application stack trace and figure out the root cause. Or you might have a more abstract problem like the user experience. That tends to be such a big problem that many teams break things down into epic stories and themes through the agile approach. When defining a problem, I first like to start with context. We have more than 600 pull requests on GitHub that must be merged. Then explain why that's an issue. It would take hours of mindless code review and button clicking to get that done. And lastly, summarize why we should solve this problem. It can be automated with the GitHub API to save us time and money. So now that we've decided this problem is worth our time, we can break it down into a bunch of smaller problems. I remember when I first got into development, I'd often ask myself, where do I start? I would have a clear vision of what I wanted to build, but just no idea how to put things in motion. And that brings us to step number two, research and refine the problem. And how do you do that? Of course, you Google it and then click on the first stack overflow result that comes up. Just copy and paste that into your code base and the problem is solved. In all seriousness, you should go out and research what other people have done to solve the same problem because you're likely not the first one. And it's perfectly okay and typically encouraged to use other people's solutions as a starting point. Just make sure you confidently understand what the code does before using it. Now in our case, we have a pretty specialized problem. Not many people have to concurrently merge 600 pull requests. If possible, discuss the idea with other developers. I want to give a shout out to Christian Wheeler on GitHub, who opened an issue that started the discussion about how we can merge all these pull requests. He provided a bash script that we can run from the command line. But after doing some more research, we realized that we would need to validate every single pull request by ensuring that each person who made a submission only modified the one file that they were authorized to modify. And that breaks our larger problem into a smaller one of how do we validate each individual pull request. Luckily, GitHub has a really nice GraphQL API that we can use to retrieve information from GitHub servers about our account. But before I started writing any code, I did some research first to make sure the API supported what I wanted to do. We can further refine the problem into two smaller objectives, retrieve all the pull requests from GitHub, and then merge each one individually. By researching the API documentation on GitHub, I was able to confirm that it supports these requirements. Now at this point, we have our main problem broken down into a few sub-problems. And we've done research on the tools and APIs that can support these requirements. In most situations, there will be more than one way to solve a problem. Like in this case, I could use the GraphQL API or the REST API. So make sure to weigh the pros and cons of alternative approaches. And now we're ready for step three, pseudocode. In this step, our goal is to write an outline for how we will implement our code. You could do this on a whiteboard, a piece of paper, or directly in your editor. The idea is that you focus on the logic of your code without having to worry about the syntax or implementation details. If you're very comfortable in a language, like in my case JavaScript, I recommend writing your pseudocode in that language. In this case here, I start with the main function, 
and then inside that function, I know I'll need a GraphQL client. I'm not sure where I'll get it, so for now I'm just using this as a placeholder, and I know it's going to need an auth token to authenticate with the GitHub API. From there, I'll need to retrieve all the open pull requests using a GraphQL query, and then I'll write a function to validate each one before merging it. In the function body, I'll add some comments about the validations that we want to run inside this function. They say there are only two hard things in programming, cache invalidation and naming things. An added benefit of writing pseudocode is that you can focus on naming things before your code gets filled up with a bunch of other syntax. So it's a great way to increase your code readability. Then from there, we'll set up a for loop, and if the pull request is valid, then we'll go ahead and merge it with a GraphQL mutation. And now we have a general idea of how we'll implement our code. Now, because we're working with an API, it's also very valuable to explore that API before you dive into it. To do that, I'm using an app called Insomnia that allows me to make requests to the API before I actually implement the code in JavaScript. GraphQL makes this especially nice because we can see the entire schema of the API without ever having to leave this app. I have an entire video dedicated to GraphQL if you want to learn more about it, but the code itself is pretty self-describing. Our query first makes a reference to the Git repo, and then we fetch 10 pull requests that have a state of open. And then we grab the fields that we know we'll need in our algorithm, like the changed files, the author, and so on. But the bottom line here is that understanding the API will make it much easier to implement the solution when we get to the code. And now we're ready for the next step, which is optional but highly recommended, test-driven development. If you're building a critical feature that your business depends on, you should test it. And yet another skill of an experienced developer is understanding what tests will be valuable for that feature. And really the only way to get good at that is to start writing tests and see where they add value to your code base. In this example, I think a valuable test would be one that checks our validation logic to ensure that the username that requested a sticker is the same as the username that made the pull request. The basic process looks like this. We start by writing a test that describes what we're actually testing. Then we execute our code using some mock data. And lastly, we write an expectation, expecting the return value of that code to be a certain shape. In this case, it should be the value of true. From here, we could expand on this by adding additional test cases with more mock data. And we can keep doing this until we're confident that our code can handle any situation that we throw at it. But one thing you might have noticed is that we're writing this test before we've written or implemented any actual code. Why would we do that? It's not always practical, but writing your test before you write your code can be extremely valuable because it takes you through the red-green refactor process. You start by writing a failing test that forces you to think about what you're trying to do. Then you figure out how to do that thing by implementing some code that makes the test pass. And from that point, you can reflect on what you've done and try to simplify or optimize your code. When you write good specs, they'll be able to catch issues in your code much quicker than you can manually debug them. And they also help prevent regressions in your code when you go back to refactor things later on. And now we're ready to move on to the easy part, the implementation details. Now, personally, when I go to implement code, I try to get it done as quickly as possible. Or in other words, have all my test passing and have a working prototype in the least amount of time possible, even if the code is not perfect. And the reason for that is psychological. Solving a big problem is a collection of small steps. And when you try to perfect every small step, it takes a really long time to get to the finish line. And that can be really discouraging. There's nothing worse for a developer than to work on a project for weeks at a time, only to have the project canceled for one reason or another. Personally, I like to rush to implement my initial code like I'm doing a hackathon. When I get to a full working prototype, I now have confidence that this problem can be solved. And now it's time to relax, get a good night's sleep, and then reflect on the code. In fact, here's a little pro tip that I've learned over the years. When you find yourself banging your head against the wall on a small problem for hours, just take a break and focus your mind somewhere else for 15 minutes. When you come back, you might magically solve that problem in five minutes. That might sound silly or just too simple, but Isaac Asimov actually explains that it's your subconscious still solving the problem while your conscious mind is doing something else. And that's why people often have aha moments right before they go to sleep or in the shower. Now that we have a full working prototype, let's take some time to reflect on it. There are many things you can look for to improve your code, so here's a short list. Improve readability by naming things better. Add comments. Remove duplication. Improve the time and space complexity of your algorithms. Add caching to reduce cloud computing costs, and improve your error handling, and so on and so on. The bottom line is that it's much easier to improve a working piece of code than it is to write a perfect piece of code on the first go around. The last thing you should keep in mind is that problem solving is a skill you never stop learning. There's an infinite number of problems to solve, each with its own unique and novel challenges, and you should take practice seriously. Practice? We're talking about practice, man. <laughs> At the end of the day, it doesn't matter which programming language, philosophy, or framework you use to solve the problem. The only thing that does matter is that you solve a problem. In my opinion, the best way to get good at this skill is to practice. It's just like a musical instrument. You're not going to pick it up and start making music right away. 
you have to spend a huge amount of time practicing and pushing yourself to overcome new challenges. When you learn to play the guitar, your fingers develop calluses, which build up over months of painful playing. When you learn how to program, your mind develops the ability to look at a problem and visualize how a computer system can solve that problem. To become really good at anything, you have to practice and repeat, practice and repeat until the technique becomes intuitive. And lastly, get feedback from other developers, especially developers that are more experienced than you. It's easy to feel self-conscious about your code, especially when you really care about it. But the more you do this, the faster your what the fucks per minute will decrease. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up there. If you have things you want to add to this video, make sure to leave them in the comments. And if you want to build entire apps with me, consider becoming a pro member at Fireship.io. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.